Good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, depending where you are around the world. It's a great pleasure to welcome you to this uh, uh, satellite symposium of uh, uh, the ISPACH uh, Congress 2022, co-organized by the Prospective Physical Activity Sitting and Sleep Consortium and uh, ISPACH uh, itself. I am Manos Tamatakis. I'm a professor of physical activity and population health at the University of Sydney. And the hat I'm wearing today is that of uh, ProPASIS uh, chair. Uh, so what I'm going to do is, uh, in this first introductory session, I'm going to, session to to share this first session, but I will also provide a little bit of background about PROPAS, because I guess that uh, many of you don't know much about PROPAS. And I will also explain, I will set the scene in terms of why we need to have this discussion, why we need to have this event about whether we are ready and how to make the transition to accelerometry device-based uh, guidelines. Before I start with this introductory sessions, I would like to uh, remind you a couple of housekeeping things. We have a dedicated uh, tag for Twitter, for those who want to tweet uh, parts of the symposium today, Propass Icepach uh, underscore 2022, and please follow us and follow Icepach um, uh, on Twitter as well. Remember that for the whole event, from the start to the end, where we, when we have uh, the moderated uh, round table discussion, uh, please uh, send your questions. Use the chat function of Zoom to send your questions to the chair uh, anytime, anytime during the talk at the end, whenever you like, and then the chair will be picking up questions and will be asking the speakers or the panel at the end. So a few things about PROPAS. So PROPAS is uh, started in 2018. We set it up here in Sydney. At the moment, uh, we're fortunate to have uh, some 100 collaborators, people who have been involved in various capacities. And PROPAS started as a data resource, as a classical data consortium. It has morphed into time, evolved into something a lot more than a consortium. So I will give you an overview of the basic three or four functions of PROPAS. So data resource is a very important function still, perhaps the core function of PROPAS. And uh, we recruit, it's a consortium, we are a consortium of cohort studies uh, with thigh accelerometry and prospective uh, linkage. Now thigh accelerometry is a, has been the initial focus, but may change. We are discussing and there's a very high likelihood that we will embrace other uh, methodologies of accelerometry in the very near future. And, um, and uh, another unique one, a very unique aspect about PROPAS as a data resource as a consortium is that we not only allow, not only we recruit cohorts which have already collected accelerometry and have all other necessary information retrospectively, but we also recruit prospectively. In other words, cohorts who may be interested, that may be interested to join PROPAS, we support them, provide devices, protocols, training, a lot of things to them to enable them to be able to do the kind of studies that PROPAS will eventually synthesize and uh, uh, publish and use, hopefully use in guidelines. Other important functions of PROPAS involves methodology development from accelerometry, intensity, uh, algorithms development, to uh, all sorts of uh, things around data processing, um, uh, development of software. We're very, very active on that front as well. Uh, we are very proud of our EMCR community. Uh, we look after the community, this community very well, and uh, we provide opportunities for leadership. Um, to whatever extent that we can boast that we have some successes, I would say I would have no reservations in saying that it's uh, to a large extent is down to our EMCRs, early and mid-career researchers who have really made a huge difference um, uh, for, for PROPAS. And uh, another more recent uh, function, we try to expand the evidence base of the uh, physical activity evidence, of the accelerometry evidence outside the known suspects. High income countries, Scandinavian, UK, uh, America, US, uh, Australia, and uh, countries where the physical activity evidence is congregated. We are trying to actively expand the evidence base, which comes, of course, with its challenges. So, what we eventually want to do is to be able to synthesize many different studies, cohort studies of accelerometry, understand health effects of unknown aspects of physical activity, and of course, 
our very core and very ultimate goal is to be able to influence future guidelines. So you see that the event today is not uh, it's it's not it's not an accident. Uh, core our core mission is about being able to influence and shape future guidelines, which will hopefully perhaps be based on device-based evidence. The geographical uh, spread of PROPAS cohorts follows that of the evidence of physical activity. As I said before, at this point in time, most cohorts, most studies are from uh, uh, Europe, uh, US, uh, UK, uh, but we are working with ISPAH very, very closely to uh, be able to, uh, to change this. And we have a partnership, which is with ISPAC, a formal partnership, which is pretty much framed around this goal. The existing physical activity and central behavior recommendations, as uh, we all know, they're based primarily on questionnaire-based evidence. Now, this is limiting. This is limiting, and this is why it's important to have the discussions we will be having today. It's limiting because we know that questionnaires capture certain parts, certain aspects of physical activity. And they don't necessarily capture these aspects very, very well. For example, I'll give you a couple of examples. So imagine that we have here a participant. They've been asked through a questionnaire to report how much exercise they did in the last week. And they said, I went to the gym for an hour last Saturday. So the researcher will record 60 minutes of vigorous intensity physical activity because the participant said, I did CrossFit for 60 minutes. Now, if the same participant was wearing an accelerometer, the accelerometer would give us a completely different picture because the accelerometer would pick up the bouts of vigorous intensity activity, as well as the bouts of moderate, as well as the bouts of standing, checking the phone, drinking water, listening to music, checking the email, and all these other things. So it could be that the accelerometer would give us something along the lines of 20 minutes of vigorous intensity, and then uh, various other components, intensities, standing, sitting, uh, other parts of the physical behavior distribution. So potentially a very large discrepancy between the two methods. And if we are to look at this kind of comparison, if we are to flip this kind of comparison and see what uh, aspects of physical activity the, the, the questioners could potentially miss. So we saw an example of the, the questioners largely overestimating an aspect of physical activity. Imagine a participant, the research participant here, they don't do any exercise at all, but they do quite a bit of vigorous intense activity during the daily living. The accelerometer very likely would pick up whatever they do. Uh, so let's say 10 minutes for the sake of example here of vigorous intensity physical activity through very short bursts of one minute, 30 seconds here and there across the day. On the other hand, the questioner would pick up nothing. Questioners cannot capture short bouts of any intensity, cannot capture incidental uh, activity of any intensity. So a fairly large discrepancy here as well. And you may argue, 10 minutes, does it really matter? Uh, it does matter. It seems to be mattering a lot. And uh, these are some very fresh, very uh, new results. We published this study, our uh, postdoc Matthew Ahmadi led this study, where the, one of the headlines results, this is UK Biobank, this is not ProPass research uh, per se yet, two bouts of uh, vigorous intensity physical activity, up to two minutes each bout was associated with 35% lower CVD mortality risk very large effect size, considering the very small dosage of physical activity. So there would have been no way that any questionnaire could have produced these results, showed us this potential health benefit of vigorous intensity physical activity. Before I go, I and before I introduce the next speaker, I would like to again highlight the very, very important role of our uh, ECRs within um, PROPAS. Um, a couple of them have a presentation later in this session. I would like to thank my colleagues at the PROPAS Working Group and my colleagues at the uh, Strategic Leadership Group. And without further ado, I would like to introduce uh, our next speaker, who is no other than Professor Fiona Boll from uh, WHO. Uh, Fiona 
is uh, WHO's head of the physical activity unit. And uh, I would uh, uh, have no reservation in uh, saying that uh, Fiona has been, Fiona's pres arrival at WHO has been a game changer for global uh, physical activity. She is the mastermind behind not only the WHO's 2020 recommendations, but also the Global Action Plan on Physical Activity. And I think that Fiona will be sharing uh, a few things about around GAPA-related developments. So Fiona, it's an honor and great pleasure to have you. Uh, the floor is yours. Thank you for joining us today. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Manos, and a very good morning or good afternoon or good evening to all of you joining. It really is a great pleasure to be here and joining uh, this important event, a satellite from the recent very successful conference in uh, in Abu Dhabi, the uh, ISPA 2022. Um, it's a great pleasure, Manos, because this is such an important area, and I really welcome the early career researchers who are joining. I welcome and am pleased to uh, hear the priority you set on low and middle income country uh, developments and research and engagement. So, <clears throat> uh, and thank you for your very kind words. I'd like to share my screen so I could bring up my um, uh, slides. So I'm looking to uh, share my screen if the coordinator could provide that opportunity. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, just, there we go. And I'll just get a confirmation that we're in PowerPoint mode. Yes, yes. Very good. good. Thank you very much. So um, you introduced that I'd be updating a little bit on news of what's been going on globally to provide a, a sort of wider context for this and just taking uh, no more than 10 minutes. It's a great pleasure for WHO to, to do such. And I'd like to uh, take us forward. Uh, to show you some of the things which Manos alluded to, in fact, the progress we're collectively making from 2018, where the uh, Global Action Plan, which most of you know on, on this call, provided the roadmap, collected the evidence and presented the set of policy actions which all countries should implement to provide the opportunities, the places, spaces, motivations and information for people to be active. We'll come back to that. You know we have tar targets. You know we have guidelines, guidelines developed now across the life course, guidelines that will soon, too soon for some, but will need updating. And that's why this work that you're discussing today, the work you're doing in research labs around the world and taking it into the practical tools that we could use is so important. We also need to help countries implement. And so the tools on the right you see are our package from WHO known as active, which is how we implement. I'll be looking forward to having the practical tool on measuring physical activity with devices and updating our technical advice to countries in the near future. We lastly have on this slide the Fair Play, an advocacy tool reflecting the impact of COVID, which for all of us highlighted the importance of physical activity and its uh, benefits for mental and physical health and the loss we had through the impact of COVID um, movement restrictions and uh, impact on our lives more generally. And so we have a suite and um, I'm using this to show you where your work fits in the uh, bigger picture. Most importantly, and many on this call will know that just two weeks ago, we added a new item to that slide. And this is the first global status report on physical activity. WHO over the last couple of years has been assessing country progress on all aspects of the Global Action Plan. You're seeing here, if you missed the launch, uh, you can find the materials on it and assess your country through the country profile cards shown in the middle, the exec summary in six languages, forthcoming will be the full report available now in English, but forthcoming in all languages. There's also a great little uh, video to capture the main messages. I want to tell you a little bit more about this because it's highly relevant for the work that you're doing. 
So if you'll allow me, and I'll draw your attention to the video of the, sorry, the recording of the uh, uh, event, if you're interested in more detail, let's have a look at what it's telling us about surveillance and measurement. I mentioned that the report itself is structured around assessing country progress on the four key pillars of the Global Action Plan. In the fourth pillar, the blue pillar, is where we have those policies, guidelines, targets, surveillance that we know enable and underpin the other three areas. The headline result is that progress is slow and uneven. It's slow because when we look at that shown here using a traffic light system, you can see only two policy indicators. Two of the 29 policy indicators are achieved by over 75%. There is a silver lining in the sense that one of those indicators is national surveillance. So countries report that they are measuring physical activity. And I do see that as progress from a decade or more ago, where physical activity was often not measured in national surveillance systems. However, in the orange and the or yellow and the red, you can see that many of the other indicators too many of the under indicators are not being implemented by uh, so many of the countries. Let us look at the key area of the um, uh, enabling uh, active systems. And you see uh, just a headline results from the global status report. On the far left, you can see we have policies Nearly half of policies I have countries are having a policy on physical acti activity, and many, many more have a policy on NCDs, including physical activity. But glance across the slide to the other variables. Guidelines, one third of countries. Targets, about a half. And there's that result on the surveillance. But I draw your attention in this group that hidden behind that 92% is variation. Variation by income, the low and, low and middle income countries having fewer. Variation by age groups for which we are me measuring physical activity, particularly in youth, and very much so far fewer countries measuring in the very younger age of under five. I highlight also we have no data on children under 10 at a global level. Surveillance is needed, measures are needed. We have huge gaps. That's one of the messages of this report. I want to finish by just giving you uh, one of the latest advocacy tools you can use. We've put a price tag on not acting on physical activity, for not investing in the research that will help countries act on physical activity. The price tag is calculated by looking at the new cases of non-communicable and mental disease, that mental health conditions, that will occur, that are estimated and predicted to occur out to 2030. They're listed on this slide and looking at the public health care costs, and it's enormous. $300 billion will be spent or required to treat the cases we can prevent through more physical activity. The manuscript is accepted for publication, and the final manuscript will be uploaded online very shortly. I draw your attention to this, and I invite you to look at the recommendations we call for. It, number four, reinforce data systems. Reinforce the quality of data, and that includes transitioning to device-based measures where appropriate and in combination when needed with self-report and driving the system of change through good data and evidence. So I welcome this meeting and I welcome the opportunity to provide a few contextual remarks and I wish you well in the discussion as you discuss how to use devices, how to analyze the data, and critically, how we can collectively move forward to an agreed body of knowledge and methods and reporting of physical activity. Thank you very much, Manos and the team organizing, and I'll hand back the floor. Thanks very much, Fiona. That's an excellent uh, overview of the direction of travel from the WHO's uh, side of things. And uh, I would like to yeah, emphasize one, once more that WHO is a key determinant here in whatever this meeting concludes. I think very little can happen without WHO's support. 
Um, so I look forward, uh, Fiona, to, uh, I'm very grateful that you made the time, I know how busy you are, to, to, to stay for the uh, debate at the end, for the round table discussion. I cannot see any questions on the chat from the audience. So for those who joined a little bit late, just to remind you that uh, uh, for questions to our speakers, please uh, put them in the chat uh, function uh, to me. And I will be able, uh, I will be able to repeat them. Um, okay, sorry. The, yeah, it looks like they've been sent, but I don't. I cannot see them. Okay. Okay. Uh, yeah, I I retrieve the questions, and uh, we have one. We have one question that for Fiona. Uh, is it moral? that technology-based measurements show a picture of much lesser physical activity and therefore giving incentive to governments to give less resources to work groups that are of risk, at high risk, I believe. How do you overcome this issue? So is Thank it- Thank you, Mara, uh, Manos. I'm uh, just gonna read that again. Is it moral that the technology-based measurements show a picture of much lesser physical activity compared with the self-report and therefore giving incentive to governments to give less resources to work groups that are of risk? I'm not quite clear what the work groups mean to this, uh, to the questioner, but um, I think it's important that we have all information. Um, it's quite clear there are differences in the measurements and therefore the estimates we have from different ways of measuring and the difference between self-report and devices is an important area to understand. It will reveal a different picture. That picture needs to be understood, but that does not mean that we would, um, and governments should interpret the data to um, only direct their efforts in certain groups. I remind everyone that the Global Action Plan calls for addressing the inequalities. So in fact, if self uh, device-based measures highlight the groups that are in most need, that is where we should be um, focusing our attention. I hope I've answered your question, but I'll stay online and look to, for any further comments on that question if I've misinterpreted it. Thanks, Manos. Thank you, Fiona. We have uh, time for another question from Katharina. Uh, I mean, the field of uh, Katharina is in the field of biological rhythms, sleep, light, and mental health, and collect a large number of actigraphic data. Uh, my question is: Are you considering to include time spent outdoors through physical activity outdoors into the intervention of myopia in children? I think this would reinforce and encourage parents and schools to change their curriculum from indoor education to outdoors? A very specific question here, if you know. Thank you, Manos, and thank you to Katharina. Uh, this is a very interesting question as you really dig into the issues of where children are active and, of course, adults and how and what we're doing. And I think, Manos, your opening slides suggested and revealed to us, of course, that there are different dimensions of physical activity and, and where you're active, indoor or outdoor, is of interest for specific areas. Of course, at the moment, and, and regretfully, global measures are really very high level. Uh, as many of you know, we report total level of physical activity as the primary indicator. Hidden behind it is the domains from which it comprises, whether that's work or home or domestic, uh, leisure or recreation, sport or through transport. I'm very pleased that we've got progress on unpacking that and beginning to show domains matter, but you're taking us to the next level of indoor outdoor. And I think it just is part of the wide picture that you're gonna be discussing in this. And why I carefully said that device measures, measures may or may not answer all the questions and self-report and other technologies and other measurements might be needed. So I think the question will remain unanswered. And at this stage, WHO is unable to do what you're doing. So we'll leave that on the table for the further discussions of this meeting and of course, going forward. Thank you, Manos. Yeah, thanks a lot, Fiona. Uh, we'll see you, Fiona, at the roundtable discussion at the end. Uh